The three kings that we read of in this story out of Scripture may be some of the most misunderstood, brave, and tragic people in Scripture. Misunderstood not just because we don't know how many there were. It says three gifts. It doesn't say three kings. But also because we call them kings, right? They're, they're kings. Well, not really. The word there is uh, more astrologer, magi, learned people. They, uh, they were of the royal family of that, I'm, I'm fairly certain, some sort of nobility. For in that day and age, you had to be of nobility for someone else to farm so that you could eat. So they had to be nobility of some sort, but they weren't kings. They're more like the third string nobility. It's like the seventh brother with six brothers ahead of you in line to the throne. They're so unimportant that when they tell their royal family that we're going to go take a hike, we'll be back in like three years, they go, okay, see ya. Right? Think about how unimportant you have to be for the running of a government. Someone say, yeah, three years off, just, just take a hike, tell us how it goes, send a letter. Right? And so they're gone for three years, they're, they're nobility of some sort, but they're like the distant cousins, like third stringers, right? They're not kings, but they are brave. You've got to give them credit for that. They're willing to take a long journey based on scriptures that are not their own, reading a language that's not their first. That's gutsy. It's even gutsier that they're heading west. They're coming out of uh, the land of the Persian Empire to the, to the east of uh, the, what we think of as the Mediterranean. And, and so as they're coming west, they're coming into a land, an area that they have fought, their culture has fought major wars of invasion with over the last couple centuries. So it's not like they're going to walk into Israel and, and people are going to hear their accents and they're going to go, yeah, we love you, right? No, no, they're going to walk in and be greeted as, as potential forerunners of an invasion force. So they're uh, not exactly uh, going to find, find it easy to get lodging. All right, so the second string, third string nobility make a gutsy decision to go look for a new king in a land that they're not going to be welcome in. That makes them misunderstood and brave. But to make understand why they are tragic, that takes a bit more explaining. You ever heard the phrase, you can never go home again? All right. You can go home, even if your parents have never moved. But if you go home, it's never the same. You go home after you've gone to college. You know, go home after you've been overseas. You go home after you've served in the military. You go home after you've begun your own family. You know what happens? You go home. It's not what it was, right? Even if you go home and, and, and you just realize for the first time, your parents are old, right? That's an odd moment. You look over and your parents, they're, they're not as young as they used to be. You can't ever go home because time keeps on marching. Things keep on happening. And that's what happens to these magi. They, they've taken a trip. They've been gone for three years, right? And it tells us that, uh, three, four years, it tells us that they go home by another path. The last verse we read today, they go home by another path, another way. And that's literally true. They don't go back through Jerusalem. But I think it's also true in a deeper sense as well. They go home, but they have been changed. They can't go home again and just be comfortable because they have had this realization. In high church, churchy language, we call this realization an epiphany, but it's, it's just a realization. They have come to see that the king that God chooses is not the type of king that they're used to. It's not the type of king they've grown up around. It's not the type of king that has privilege and glory and gold and power. Right? They have found this king in the most humble of situations. And they're going back. Right? And what happens when you're, you're part of the nobility and you go back and you've learned something profound about the nature of being a king? It doesn't line up with how your family rules and you show up back at home. Right? How's that going to work? It's going to be a bit awkward, isn't it? Right? It makes them brave and makes them a bit tragic because they go home and they are changed and the other folks in their family cannot understand. And it's not like they probably didn't try to share this, but you know, it just it's hard to share. Right? There, there's something they've been changed and people probably looked at them kind of strange. T. S. Eliot, a British, I believe British uh, poet, writes a, a bit writes about this, and he he writes a poem about the journey of the Magi I want to read to you about uh, this shift. The, he writes of the journey, a cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of year for a journey, and such a long journey. The way's deep, the weather sharp, the very de dead of winter. It's a fitting poem for today. The very dead of winter, and the camel's gold, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted. The summer palaces on their slopes, the terraces, and silken girls bringing sherbet. Then 
camel men cursing and grumbling and running away and wanting their liquor and women and night fires going out and lack of shelters and cities hostile and towns unfriendly, villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end we preferred to travel at night, sleeping in snatches with the voices singing in our ears saying that this was folly. Then at dawn we came down to a temperate valley wet below the snow line smelling of vegetarian vegetation, with a running stream and a water mill beating the darkness, and three trees on the low sky. An old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands and an open door dicing for pieces of silver, and feet kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information, and so we continued, and arriving at evening not a moment too soon, finding the place it was, you might say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago. I remember, and I would do it again, but set down, set this down, this. We were led all that way for birth or death. There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence, and no doubt I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation. With an alien people clutching their gods, I should be glad of another death. Hear that bit at the end, right? No longer at ease. They go home, and, and their family has turned from the people they're familiar with, and they've seen truth, and they go home, and now it's not family, it's alien people clutching their gods. No longer at ease because they've seen something, and they've come back changed and different. Something has been born and something has died. And that's what happens whenever you realize something. When you, to realize something, to, to, be, to have something born, a new realization, something has to die. The old way of see, seeing things, right? You can't see it a new way if the old way doesn't die. And so these magi, they show up and they, they have been born and their understanding has changed and they see nobility in a different way and their ability to see their friends and family as it once was, is gone. And the way T.S. Eliot ends that poem, say, having them say, I should be glad of another death, that is rather brave, to say that you'd embrace uh, change like that, to embrace and look for a change that would shape and change how you see the world. The challenge of an epiphany, and this is the challenge of the Magi shape, is that you can't epiphany for someone. They can't go home and tell someone, we've had this realization, and they can't realize it for someone else. I mean, the, the kind of crass comparison is, you ever ask someone to help you with your computer, and they can tell you about it, and they can tell you about it, and they can tell you about it, but they can't do it, but if they're over the phone, they can't do it for you, right? I can, I can tell you how to fix your computer, but, but I can't understand it for you. Right? I, I have to be right there and I have to, you have to see it with me. And that's the type of thing that happens with, with epiphany. I can, I can tell you about it, but I can't understand it for you. And you can't understand it for me. I mean, that, that's how it works. We have to understand for ourselves. We have to realize for ourselves. A, a big, more serious example of this is uh, every parent at some point realizes that you can't protect your children from everything. Right? You can teach your children, you can help your children, you, you can try to help them recover when things do go bad, you can give them advice, but you can't protect them from everything. Right? You know this. You ever try to tell a new mom this? Good luck. All right? I can tell you this, and those are wonderful facts, Andy, but until you realize it for yourself with your own children, you don't really know it. All right? in, in the same way, I can tell you, I'm, I'm gonna t I had an epiphany, um, nigh on a decade ago, and I'll tell you about it, but I, I, I tell you about it knowing that you may not see it the same way, and I'm probably about to get some strange looks. Isn't that a great precursor? Aren't you wondering what I'm about to tell you about? It's, it's fun. Uh, I was sitting drinking tea, uh, working on a paper, and a friend of mine from seminary was there as well, we were in seminary, and uh, for some reason politics came up and wor worship, and, and my friend said that the flag should never be in the sanctuary. American flag should never be. And I, I of course, said, no, what's, what's wrong with that? And, and so my friend started, we started debating. We got absolutely jacked on in that paper that night. And my friend pointed out, to display the flag properly, the flag code says the flag has to be in the place of highest honor in a room. We're in a sanctuary. What, what should be in the place of highest honor? 
right? Can anything else be in a place of higher honor than the cross in the sanctuary? Nope, right? And, and so, you, but I argued, because I argued, and, and it, me arguing with my friend, we argued for a long time. It makes me wonder how long the Magi sat looking at Jesus thinking, really? That, huh? I mean, epiphanies don't happen instantly. It doesn't all, all click all at once. Sometimes you've got to debate with yourself, and I did. And so I pointed out, you know, we have a Christian flag, right? Here, over here, we've got a Christian flag. What's on the Christian flag? It's a cross, right? But which flag's in the place of higher honor? In case you haven't brushed up on your flag code, I'm an Eagle Scout, I'll help you remember. The place to the right of the speaker is the place of highest honor. So we put a, a cross at a place of lower honor than a flag in a sanctuary where we say Jesus is Lord. Huh. I, I, we argued for a long time about that. It was an epiphanal moment for me because it got me thinking about how we understand what it says to be Jesus as Lord and Jesus has a place of highest honor because you know what? We don't elect Jesus. We tend to think of politics as something that you know we, we elect our president and if we don't like him, we vote him out. Um, what ma what cha if you don't like what Jesus says, you know how much that matters? Right? It doesn't. Jesus is king. It doesn't matter whether you approve. It's Jesus. Jesus is in charge, right? So it, 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 this whole way of thinking that in this room, what has the place of highest honor matters, and it, it's a statement about what we believe to be most true. I mean, it, it all began drinking tea, having this epiphanal moment, arguing about whether a flag should be in a sanctuary. And to this day, I, I, if, when something is born, something, a new understanding, something else dies. I can no longer walk into a sanctuary, see a flag, and be comfortable with that. It bothers me. Right? It bothers me, and, I'm, I'm, and I get strange looks talking about that. The strange looks that the Magi got when the Magi showed up and they started talking about how a kingship doesn't look how you expect it. You, want, you know what? Their family looked at them. They probably looked at them strange. What happened to you? You went away and you're back three years later. You went away, nice normal lad. What, what changed, right? They had an epiphany. It changed. They can't be comfortable in what, how things just are anymore. And, and, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. I, I'm just not. And I'm not saying that because I, I, I expect everyone to agree with me right now. I don't expect everyone to change their mind immediately. But that's the, I think, sort of the misconception about an epiphany, is that an epiphany is not su a sudden realization where everything clicks and now makes perfect sense. I think in some ways an epiphany is a realization that leads you to start questioning things you never questioned before. Right? This, the, the Magi, they saw a king, and they started questioning, what, what's the nature of being a king? If this is the king that God chooses, what's that mean about what I think about who a king is? And I've, I've introduced this thought about, should a flag be in here? Maybe you agree with me, maybe you didn't, but you've never thought about it before, had you? And now you are. Welcome to Epiphany. Right? Welcome to Epiphany. These realizations, these are at the core of Epiphany. These moments where we, we realize something that might sound simple, like forgiveness really is a better way. I mean, I can say that, but to really realize it, that, that you can be forgiven, that, that God will provide, these are the things that can be the, 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 what we realize, and, and I can say them, but for me to say them and you to realize them are two different things. Right? And to be, continue to be open to such realizations, the challenge of this is that we can't schedule them. If you think about all the other holy days on the, of the, the Christian year, right? We can schedule them. Right? Christmas, what do you, we're scheduling a beginning, the beginning of, of the life of Jesus Christ, and we're, we can schedule that. Let's get together and schedule a celebration of a birth. The, the baptism, we can schedule excuse me, so schedule a baptism and talking about t temptation and talking about how you begin ministry. Easter, we can schedule. What's Easter about? Reconciliation and forgiving. We can schedule that. What's Epiphany about? Unexpected realizations. Okay, on January 6th, I put my calendar. January 6th, Epiphany, I'm going to schedule an unexpected realization for 2.30. I mean, that, that's just not how it works, is it? Right? You don't schedule sudden and unexpected realizations about the nature of how God works in the world. You can't, it, that's what makes this a very hard Christian moment to, to, to get at. And these re realizations take time, and they take pondering, and they take discussion, and uh, not things that we really make a lot of time for today, right? 
The Magi, if you think about them, they saw Jesus, they stayed for a bit, they dropped off their gifts, and then they had a, at least a year of a hike back to think about what they just saw. And we don't have contemplation time like that. We're often too busy. C.S. Lewis points out that busyness not only is of the devil, but the busyness, the way that we get distracted by everything going on, might be the very nature of, of temptation, of Satan. Right? That, that being forever busy and distracted and scattered is the slow road away from Christ and towards something far worse. So, so to make room for epiphany in our lives, to make room for understandings and discussions and contemplations of questions we've never asked before, it takes time alone to, to think about what, what we don't just to be able to be, think for ourselves, and it takes time with others. It takes time to discuss the things that matter, not just talk about the weather, but to ask someone so seriously. Forgiveness. Tell me what does it look like for you to forgive, right? for example. It always takes bravery to embrace these discussions as well, to embrace the possibility of epiphany, because if something is being born in us, something else is going to die, and I cannot tell you how much my blood, blood pressure and heart rate went up just to say in public that, that having that makes, having the flag in here makes me nervous. I have been nervous about saying that all week, right? To, be, to say that you're open to something being born new means that you have to be willing to stand by it, and it makes you nervous because you're afraid people are going to look at you, like some of you have already. And they did at Green City, too, don't worry. They, they, they looked at me. What happened to you, Andy? You're strange. Uh, sorry. Had an epiphany. I do give thanks for the Magi who show us the nature of having an epiphany, who show us that having these realizations, these understandings, it takes bravery. And it's my prayer for us that we might be brave enough to follow in their footsteps. Amen.